Overall, we're at a spectacular time for video game storytelling right now. The cinematic highs and blockbuster production of the AAA scene, the more cerebral fare of the indie circuit, it's safe to say we've mastered the art of interactive narrative. Point being, and it's been the case for decades now, any number of characters you might write off in the moment can come back around to being essential when all's said and done. I'm Scott from WhatCulture.com, and these are seven pointless video game characters who were actually crucial. Number seven, Mayor S. Kate, Pokemon Coliseum. Although Pokemon Coliseum was ostensibly sold as a souped-up GameCube update to N64 favorite Pokemon Stadium, its assumedly tacked-on story mode is not as terribly cack as you might imagine. In fact, it's arguably the most interesting and original single-player Pokemon story of the last 20 years. Instead of the usual 10-year-old who ventures off into the world's caves, cruise ships, and casinos, you're the trench coat swishing Wes, a silver-haired bad boy who has a big line across his face because, well, it was the style of the time. As an ex-thief of Team Snagger, you don't actually catch Pokemon, but steal them from the disgruntled former gangmates that you meet across the Mad Max-esque world of all. Also, you start with an Umbreon and an Espeon, and every battle is 2v2. Honestly, it's very refreshing, and a notably standout story about purifying corrupt creatures. Along the way, you'll stop off in the oasis town of Fennec, then get to plumbing the depths of all Cedia locales, such as the finger-clicking pyrite town and its underground fight pit. 20 plus hours later, at the climax of the game, you'll have completely forgotten about one Mare SK from way back when. Turns out though, and maybe his mustache was a giveaway from the beginning, this fella was the main bad guy all along. Number 6, Bren Tilda, Banjo Kazooie. A game stuffed with charm, awesome sound effects, and memorable characters in equal measure, Bren Tilda, the fairy godmother sister of Banjo Kazooie's wicked witch Gruntilda, doling out obscure bits of information about her kin. In a game entirely about collecting shiny tat with googly eyes, that Brentilda doesn't give you any additional loot suggests it's all for nothing, and she's nothing more than a charming set of throwaway interactions. Turns out though, Brentilda is anything but. You'd best have been jotting down all those seemingly random facts because they weren't just excuses for terrible puns. Instead, they are all the answers to questions in the game's quiz show finale. Hilariously, designer Greg Mails later described Ben Tilda as his least favorite character, saying this whole idea was one of the worst pieces of design I ever created. Number 5, Mobius the Time Streamer, Legacy of Kane. The Legacy of Kane's narrative is a glorious stage play of Shakespearean flair, replete with time-traveling vampires and a lot of gothic architecture to get lost in. It's perfectly understandable if some of the key details manage to go over some people's heads, especially as one of the most crucial, i.e. who the villain even is, isn't made truly clear until the end of the second game. Ostensibly, Soul Reaver's withered anti-hero Raziel is trapped in a bitter back and forth with vampiric Lord Kane and Cthulhu and Puppeteer, the Elder God. After being thrown into the pit of the damned by Kane because Raziel dared to let his body evolve faster than everyone else, this set the stage for years of Kane vs. Raziel fan art and some Tomb Raider DLC. Turns out though, the awesomely voiced Elder God has been using you all along, and yet there's more. The final battle ends with Raziel chasing Kane into a time machine, and when he emerges, he's confronted by a random withered man in a robe. Anyone who played the series' first installment top-down RPG Blood Omen will recognize this particular creature as Mobius the Time Streamer, a potentially forgettable character across all Soul Reaver lore. In reality though, as every other game would spell out, and especially in retrospect, he's secretly the most important individual in all of Nosgoth. Number 4, Kickback, Yoku's Island Express. The best way to describe Villa Gorilla's criminally overlooked Yoku's Island Express is like a cross between Sonic Spinball and Ori and the Blind Forest, with a touch of Paperboy flung in for good measure. Your Yoku, a little red dung beetle who arrives at the tropical island of Mokumana to take up the position of Postmaster. With the aid of your ever-present ball of poop, it's up to you to flip and bounce the mail to every last resident. Also, there's a whole thing about evil gods and existence itself being absorbed by a suddenly awakened evil. It really goes places. About 20 minutes in, the frustration of falling into the game's various pitfalls is alleviated when you meet Kickback, a weird flying pufferfish thing who's here to help. Kickback isn't a character as such, more a handy gameplay mechanic to keep you moving if you've died enough. There is a chance if you're some Adonis of gaming, like the I beat Hades on my third run of Josh Brown, you won't even meet Kickback at all, which would break everything. In the vast majority of cases though, Kickback will become extremely familiar, which leads to the biggest rug pull in the game because it was the evil god all along. Sprouting extended claws to drive the point home, Yoku's Island Express ends in a notably hard boss battle to finish this thing off for good. Number 3, The Cat, Ghost Trick. 
Ghost Trick is a novel Capcom adventure on the Nintendo DS, in which you help the deceased spirit of Sissel discover the details of his own fate by possessing various inanimate objects to solve complex environment-altering puzzles. Coming from Shu Takumi, the brain behind Phoenix Wright, Ghost Trick is predictably ridiculous, and just like those signature courtroom dramas, there are many big reveals coming your way. The biggest and stupidest is reserved for the very end. After all manner of household appliances pivoting, swiveling, and generally falling over to piece together the past, we learn that all this time you weren't the ghost of the dead human, but his cat. Yes, his cat. The clues were there all along. For example, despite being a person with, you know, speech, Sissel is continually impeded by an inability to read, and goes on about loving cramped dark places. If there's a murder mystery plot reveal more crazy than it was the cat all along, please let me know down in the comments. Number 2, Thomas Downs, Red Dead Redemption 2. The unifying philosophy of Red Dead Redemption 2's design is hyperrealism to the point of intentional mundanity. A lot of people absolutely love this feeling of VR without the goggles, but looking at completion data, it's nowhere near enough to get more people through. Regardless, there's a pace where both everything and nothing should stick with you. Fans champion the animation of opening individual drawers of a house, whilst others want to jump out the window. With all of this bearing down on you, grizzled outlaw Arthur Morgan's eventual death doesn't come through an epic duel soundtrack by the whistling wind, but the slow degradation of tuberculosis. Anyone who's read a Victorian novel knows that from that first cough, something's up. Video game characters literally don't do bodily functions unless it's important or a game mechanic, but the source of everything appeared much earlier. Whilst roughing up a debtor by the name of Thomas Downs on behalf of loan shark Leopold Strauss, Morgan gets an eyeful of the man's blood. At the time, it seems like business as usual, which is entirely the point. Downs is just one of several debts that Arthur needs to collect, as part of a mission that absolutely screams tutorial. It's literally busy work to the character and us, and by the time our stricken cowboy drops down in Saint Denis, you've probably forgotten who Downs was, let alone remember that fate ceiling splutter. And number one, Toru Adachi, Persona 4. A murder mystery is nothing without its reveal, and boy does Persona 4 have one of the best in gaming history. With the story already a brilliantly written character drama surrounding your hero's arrival in Inaba, you're quickly thrown into a chase the killer plot with a sick supernatural edge and a phenomenal cast. Among them is your uncle Dojima, who doubles as a lead detective on the case, with his lackey Adachi tagging along, appearing every now and then to relay certain pieces of information to the gang. The jury's out on whether Persona 4 actually beats Persona 5 today, but for me, this is an absolute favorite. The music and sound effects alone are 90s Final Fantasy worthy, and that's before you get stuck into such a brilliantly laid out case of plot twists and slain bodies. With such a sprawling set of options for who the killer could be then, the second you realize it's the young Meek Adachi, whose motivation centers on the idea that anyone spending any time in a negative headspace wants to end it all anyway, the game wraps back around to those introductory scenes some 70 hours ago. It's every bit a killer reveal, and helps make this fourth installment gaming royalty that its criminal isn't available anywhere other than the PlayStation 2 and PlayStation Vita. And those are just a collection of various subtle characters that were actually crucial. Let me know your favorites down in the comments below, and please subscribe to the What Culture Gaming Podcast. For now, I've been Scott from whatculture.com, and I'll catch you soon.